Um, I want to have a conversation um, that really has been inspired by, um, in, in many ways, my relationship with, well, inspired by a lot of things, but um, by things that I, I hear people say and the conversations I have. And, and, and what, I, what I want to say to you all is that, um, you know, there is a way in which people, you, you know, when, when you're only listening to a part of a conversation, it, it seems like, let's say in, uh, in, in black America here, when, when you're only listening, when you're only asking black people about questions related to inequality and racism and discrimination, and that's the, the, the vast majority of the time that black people are talking or in the media. It's kind of like with Arab Muslims. When, you know, whenever Arab Muslims kind of hit the news, it's not about like, hey, what television programs do you like? You know, or what kind of music do you listen to? Or... You know, what do you do on your Saturday mornings? Or do you like to golf? Or do you like whatever? It's always about, you know, Islamophobia and, and, uh, and you know, um, radical Islam and, you know, this kind of thing, right? And so similar with black Americans. It's kind of, you know, we're, we're always just talking about, like, discrimination and racism. And so we have this idea that, you know, this is what people are thinking about all the time. You know, and it's not. People have lives. I mean, this guy, Adam, right here, I'm going to say something. And, and some of you all, by the way, um, given the scores on how, how you're keeping up with things in the class, you might be really interested in his, yo, can you, can, are we up? Can you? Are we good? Here. So Adam wrote this book. When did you write this, man? Um, I started writing the book actually senior year of high school, but I didn't finish it until spring of my freshman year. All right, cool, man. And uh, it's cool. I, I read it last night. I read it, not word for word, but I, I, I read it and I, and I bought a copy and I'm like, hey, this is actually really cool. And a lot of y'all could really use it. And um, I'll send the link out. Next time I send an email to the whole class, I'll send the link out. But you can get the, you can get the, the, um, electronic version for how much is the electronic version the electronic version is seven dollars and paperback is only four, 14. dude seven dollars right you could probably do quite well but in any case um but the, but if you if you were talking if you met adam the first thing if you're you know if you're not used to talking about these issues and having conversations about this you wouldn't ever think to ask him about his about a book or time management or to, i mean you might if he's dressed in a suit you might say like Yo, what's up with time management stuff? But, you know, you're going to immediately say, oh, he's a black guy. And so, you know, let's talk about these issues here. Because all people, black people want to talk about these issues, right? And, uh, and so, and, and what happens, it's just kind of like, it's like assuming that white people are, are, are don't, don't, aren't thinking about this stuff, or Americans aren't, or whatever the case is. And so, I, I feel like this class is so important for us to just kind of keep pushing and prodding and poking and so on, right? So today, we're going to push and prod and poke these three folks up here. And we are going to, and I have a, a, a friend um, who is joining us. Can we, you can put the slide up with, with um, so the title, by the way, is called How the Rich Live. So it, it, I'm really, really, um, oh, this is going to be fun. Um, go to the, so the next slide. So this is Ernso. Uh, Ernso is a friend um, who I met through one of his, ch his middle child, his daughter, um, who was a student of mine, mm, I guess about 12 years ago. Whoa. Uh, 13 years ago. Um, and when she came to see me one time in my office, and she said, uh, you know, Sam Richards, I'll, I'll never, she's really funny. She's really cool. Uh, she said, Sam Richards, you need to meet my father. I really think you'd love, you'd like my father, and I think he'd like you. And uh, so I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm never going to get to Haiti, you know, so I'm never going to meet your father, but maybe someday it'll happen, right? Well, lo and behold, about four months later, um, I, a, student e a former student sent me an email and said, hey, I'm, I'm, li I'm living in Haiti right now. She it was working at a hospital down there. And, and, and I immediately texted back and I said, hey, can I come visit you? 
Because that's what I do with students, you know, just be aware of that. You know, like 10 years from now, I'll be coming and visiting you in outer Mongolia or something, you know what I mean? So, so she says, okay, let me find out. And she said, yes. And so I went down and I got to meet her father. And immediately, I, we just connected. We, we realized that we were brothers, twin brothers of different mothers. And uh, so we've sustained this relationship over the years. Uh, Ernso, go ahead, next slide. Um, so there's, this is Haiti, by the way. So you see where, where we're at here. You know, off the coast. It's not too far from the coast of Florida. This is the island of Hispaniola where uh, the, the, the f- first uh, Europeans landed. Uh, Columbus, the first ships landed, and uh, in Haiti is the first black republic in the, in the, in the Western Hemisphere, in the world, actually. Um, but it's very close to the United States, right? Okay, next slide. We'll keep going. So Ernso is, um, is a really unique person. I should talk to you all here also because Ernso does a lot of things, he, he, but, but more than anything else, he's a businessman and he's a job creator. He's also a pastor and he has a church, but that's only because people around him have decided, hey, we, you, know, you, we, you need to start a church, like, let's go. And I'm actually a member of his church, so, uh, and an honorary member, I suppose. And, and Sos 118 is a longstanding friend of not only the church, but his work, because Ernso's a job creator. And that's the fundamental thing he does in Haiti is creating jobs for people. And, and so this is him just at a workshop. This is Ernso with his wife, Gina, his better half, and my wife, Lori, my better half. We were down in Haiti a couple right before the pandemic. Um, and it's, uh, you know, just a really cool friendship. But... Um, go to one more, I think. Is there one more? No, go back. Okay, so um, Ernso, why don't we, let's bring Ernso. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great, Sam. How, how is everybody? We are, a, we are rocking yeah, and rolling. Great. I'm glad to be on. Yeah, and, uh, glad, to, glad to have you. We, we're going to try to get Ernso here this week, but it just didn't work out. So, um, it's great. You're not going to be able to see me, but you can see these. Well, here, hang on. Let me just come back here. Yeah. So you can see me now, right? We're good? Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw you. Yeah, All right. Definitely. <laughs> Handsome as ever, right, my friend? <laughs> yes, yeah, <yeah>, sir. <laughs> just like oh. you. Uh, hey, so let, let, I'm going to have these three students introduce themselves to you if, you if they would. Okay. So why don't we start with Randy? Hi, everyone. I'm Randy. Um, I'm a senior majoring in biobehavioral health, and I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hello, everyone. I'm Adam Douglas. I'm a second year business management student here at Penn State, and I am also from Philadelphia. Hi, uh, I'm Dio. I'm a freshman, and I'm from Santa Ana, Costa Rica. Dio, Adam, and Randy. Okay, awesome. Um, Okay, great. So, Ernso. Um, didn't let me just first off ask you, so you're back in 119, you've been here many times, speaking live, and yeah. speaking on video. How, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. And, uh, you know, because of pandemic, we, we have to kind of stay home most of the time. We don't travel that much. Um, we only travel every other month to the U.S. Hey. So... I'm glad that I'm here this afternoon for this conversation. And nice to see you guys and the start. Hey, and just before we get started, let me just ask quickly, how is COVID in Haiti? How is COVID in Haiti? Yeah, how are things? Yeah. Well, uh, if you guys been following international news, Haiti has been on the news a lot. But as for COVID, we are, we are very lucky. We don't have that many case of COVID in Haiti like all the other places in the world. Uh, our rate is very, very low. And uh, people kind of, they don't care about it. They don't really pay attention to COVID because they have other stuff to worry about. When you live in Haiti, you don't worry about stuff like that. You worry about surviving every day, trying to live every day. Yeah. That's 
they don't, because they don't care about COVID, so COVID kind of stay away from them. Yeah, and I would think that COVID is, COVID's afraid of Haiti, probably. Yeah, yeah. Listen, um, okay, Ernso, let me, you got the slides, right? I, I sent them to you? Yes, sir. All right, okay, so listen, you all. Um, let's go to the, let's go to the, the, this next slide. So we're, I want to talk right now about inequality. And I want to have a conversation about inequality with a certain premise that um, the, you all, the three of you are very privileged. And, um, and just what that means and how you think about it. So I want to know like how, you know, everyone in this class is very privileged. But I want to know how it is that you all think about your privilege. And we're going to have a conversation about the ins and outs of that and what that means. Um, so first off, you know, you've got 7.9 uh, billion people. And Ernst, we're going to walk through, and I'm going to invite you in in a, in a minute. Okay, um, okay. Almost 8 billion people in the world. Um, eight, 800 million people living on $1.90 or less per day. That's $1.90. So don't, don't think. And what's really important that you understand is that doesn't mean, well, you know, in other countries like Haiti, uh, it's really inexpensive to live there. So $1.90 can go a long way. Like, Ernso, what is a, what is a, a pound of rice cost, right, white rice in Haiti right now in U.S. dollars? Well, a pound of, of, of rice uh, in U.S. dollars, you would say... Uh, I would say close to uh, let, let me let me calculate that. Uh, I mean, we only sell it by by five pounds. Okay. Uh, like five pounds of rice would cost about almost ten ten US dollars to okay. buy. Uh, like, yeah. So that, uh, all right. So that's about two. That's about a pound of rice. So eight, you know, mm -hmm. eight hundred million people living on dollar ninety a day. So they, that's going to buy you about a pound of rice. And so, I mean, think about all the things you need to live and so on, right? So let's, uh, you know, 2 billion people living on three about $3.10 per day. So think about the implications of that. Um, 20,000 children dying every day from easily curable diseases and mostly from um, stomach, uh, from parasites and, uh, and diarrhea. Okay, so easily, very easy to... to keep most of the 20,000 uh, infants alive. And 72 million children in the world are not of school age are not in school. Okay, so just, mm -hmm. I just want, you know, like you really have to kind of step out to understand the implications of that and what that means, okay? But now here, I wanna, I wanna show you a, a graph here that um, is the next piece. So, um, this, so we, we uh, I, I found this the other day. The World Bank put this together. And could you have a, yeah. And, and they're looking at like who the really wealthy people are in the world. And I, and I you, know, I'm, you know, based on how much wealth they have, how much they control and so on, right? So the richest 1% are people that have a total wealth. This includes the value of their home, the value of their car, the value of their investments, like all the value instilled that they can control. The richest people in the world, the richest 1% have over just anything over a million dollars. The next 11% are people who we would call middle class in the world. This is the entire world. Are people that, that have the equivalent of about $100,000 up to a million. And then poor are 10,000 to 100,000 and miserable, like people just really in, living in really difficult, dire conditions, um, over $10,000. And look, these are the numbers here, right? So I looked at data, income data for this class. And I started doing some calculations about who is in this class. Because I know, you know, each semester, um, I didn't do it this semester yet, but I do, I collect data on you know, what are, what's your background? What's your family background? How much money do you have? This sort of thing, right? And I estimate that of the 7 million, 780 students in the class, 700 of you are in the blue section. Okay? Not just you, right? Because maybe you, you don't have that money, but with your parents, and, it, and certainly by the time you got out into the workforce, 
and you start working a little bit and you add it together with your family, the power that your family has and so on, you're, you're going to be in the blue. 75 of you in the green, which means that almost everybody in this class is in the richest 12%. But that richest 1% is the one that's like, oh my God, the richest 1% of people in the world. So Ernso, you and I talk about this a lot, about how people often um, only compare themselves with people who are much wealthier than they are, but we often mm -hmm. don't compare ourselves with people who are down below us. Definitely. You had, you had, you, I remember you had a statement about Drew, when Drew was in Haiti and what he said. And what yeah. He said, yeah. Yeah, Drew Mohoric is one of the students at Penn State that came down to Haiti to, to kind of, or an internship with me. And then she found that everybody was in Haiti, they kind of were, they were very happy. And then he was wondering, how come people can be so poor? And then they are happy. And then uh, he was he started to make that research. And before he went back to the US, he told me, and so I find the answer. Everybody's comparing themselves to somebody who was, who was poorer than them. So they feel like they're richer than, 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 than the other person. So that's why they keep, they don't compare themselves with people that are rich. They compare themselves with people that are poorer than them. So that's why they're so happy. That's part of what his research was, or was fine. But I find out that there's a lot of inequality, definitely, in the world. Yeah. About our wealth, it distributed. Yeah. And so when you think, Ernso, about all the people in the class, and hang on one second, I'm going to do this real fast. So I'm just going to spin around here. Okay, got it? Yeah. All right. Think about all the people in the class, and the vast majority of them would be people who are in that wealthiest 1%. And that, wow. you know, and that's really stunning, right? It's really stunning. So what does that mean to the, those, those, you know, what does that mean for us? And so if we go to the next slide really fast, this is how much money people are controlling. So the richest 1% is controlling almost half of all of the world's wealth. And the poorest 55% is controlling about 1% of the world's wealth, which means most people in Haiti. So you, you know, you're, so you have to shift, right? And so for me, and so for people like me and people like Ernso, who are very global in our orientation, you know, it's natural for us to make this connection between like who we are and how other people are doing in the world. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very fascinating shift. So the first question I have for you all, the three of you is like, how is that to be, to be rich? Do you like, how, how is it to be rich? I mean, you know, we talk about the 1%, right? So how is it to be in the 1%? Anybody can go. You know, it's funny that you guys are bringing this up simply because uh, a lot of people, they, ooh, the Zoom is gone, at least for us. But uh, a lot of people, they see where we are now, they see where I'm at now, and they're like, oh, like, you know, you're from the suburbs or something like that, right? But uh, I personally grew up uh, middle child for a very long time because my mom had me at 17, and uh, we we didn't have a lot. Uh, my yeah. mom was a, a clerk at uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and we, we pretty much survived off that for a good number of my years. But now she's very highly educated, I guess, uh, in terms of uh, the world wealth. She would have had a meteoric rise to the top one percent because. Now she's got her master's degree, she's going for her doctorates, and that's, I wouldn't say it's the easiest thing to do, but it's a very straightforward path to take here in America, where a lot of other countries, they don't have that sort of opportunity. But um, one of the things that I would say definitely differentiates us in America is like the values that we have. Okay. Um, but well, let, me, let me go back though. So let me just think about, just for you, really fast, right? How's it feel to be rich? It feels like any other day because it's the norm for us. Uh huh. Got you. So for you, it's the norm. Uh huh. Um, Dio, how about you? So I don't have a nice like rags to riches story like you did exactly. I, you know, I I, I can't lie. I was born into like old money, like old old. Um, I won't go into more details than that because my parents are very self conscious about it. Um, and. 
so it's interesting because I was also homeschooled. And so I never, I didn't have anything to compare rich life to for most of my life. So like I didn't even know there was any different way of living, let's say, until I started high school when I actually like went to non-home high school. And then I was like, wow, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, like I agree like pretty much any other day, but then also I, like I, I look at other people and then I feel like weird because I don't know, like why do I have that? You know what I mean? Uh-huh, mm -hmm. uh-huh, okay. Randy, how about you? Um, so for me, it's, I think, so when I'm like sitting in this room, if I'm just comparing myself to like people here, I'm not considered rich, but like compared to the rest of the world mm -hmm. um, and like poorer countries, I am considered rich because like my parents are immigrants. So like here we're con like people will be calling me and was like, oh, yeah, can you send me this? And I'm like, I don't even have the money for myself. But like mm -hmm. you expect me to send you like fifty dollars. But like, I mean, I still send it just because like I know like it's hard for them. Um, so you have family in Liberia. Right? Yeah. Uh huh. Um, it's hard for them, and like, but they're living, like, $50 can really take you a long way. Uh -huh. Like, you can probably eat good for, for, like, a week for, like, living off of, like, $10. Uh -huh. Like, that can feed you for, like, a week or two. So I think here I'm not considered rich amongst everybody else, but, like, comparing back home, I'm considered rich. So it feels good because I don't have to, like, worry about what I, I don't have to worry about where my next meal is coming from or like anything like that. Uh-huh. Okay. So. I got you. Here, hang on one second. Hey. Gentlemen. You're deep in conversation up there. All right. Okay. We good? This is, I like this. Do you guys like this? This sound right here? It's cool, right? So, so Randy, you, what, what we're talking about here with Ernso, you have, you have direct access to that. You've been really living with that, right? Because again, so Ernso knows this, right? Your, parent, your, your parents come here, but they're still connected to people back home. And people back home are a, a tiny little bit can really can move and can shake, make lots of things happen. Mm -hmm. So how do you, um, Ernst, so let me ask you, how is it for you? You know, as, I mean, you're, you're a person who didn't grow up rich, very similar. You know, you did, cre were crazy hard. Um, and now, you know, you're, you do quite well, but not by the standards of the 10 rich families in Haiti, but, you know, you're, um, it's still a, a struggle, but you're a hard worker, you're an entrepreneur. You're, how is it for you? Well, <clears throat> uh, it's been very, very difficult, but uh, I find out that I was lucky. I was one of the person that was lucky. My father valued education a lot. As a small farmer in Haiti with 12 kids, we're not supposed to be where we are today. I was, I'm not supposed to be where I'm at today. But my dad was a very hard worker. He helped me get an education in the US. At least uh, with that, that gave me an edge on most of people in Haiti. That's how I decided to go back to Haiti to see if I can help other people get out of poverty. Because the way to get out of poverty is to hard work, Stay in school, focus yourself, discipline yourself. That's what I'm teaching these young people that I'm doing every day, to trying to help them to get out of poverty. Because poverty is not, is not nice. And, and it's not pretty. It's not pretty at all. And so, for, and, you, no, go ahead, go ahead, finish. Yeah. And, and I, for example, we're going to have carnival in the, in the next two weeks. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put the 200 young people in my church to retreat for four days. Give them three meals a day. I ask them to pay $20 for the, for the three days, for the four days. 
they cannot do it. They told me it's too much money for them. I can understand that. For most kids in the U.S., four days for twenty dollars, three meals a day, everything include sleeping, everything. They cannot afford it. And then you, you can understand how poor these people are. But some way, somehow, we're gonna make it happen because it's a way for me to train them and teach them. As you see in the slide, we did this every year to train these young people to show them how to how to get out. Because Haiti, Haiti is a poor country, of course, but we can we don't have to accept it as a fact. We can get out of it. Because my children, they were lucky lucky enough for me to send them to Penn State to come study. And, and now, going back to Haiti, they'd be able to find a job with NGOs, USAID, all these big organizations. They, they, they cannot consider themselves as poor in Haiti. But it's, it's like I was, like I say, it's, it's, uh, you have to be lucky and you have to uh, be determined. Because my background really we were, we come from a very poor family, and but we, 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 we make it, we yeah. made it. Not, not as somebody in the US, as but in Haiti, we be able to help other people in Haiti. Mm. And Ernst, so to be clear, when you came to the US, you didn't come with any money. You just came with, you just had a visa. You came with what, like a hundred dollars or something? And you just said, okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna make it happen. Then you got your degree. Well, yeah, I came on a student visa. And then at the time, it was very, it wasn't too expensive. $1,300 for a semester. I was able to go to school. My dad, working as hard as he, he was doing in Haiti, he helped me pay for the tuition. With that for me, and then I find out in the U.S. you can make it, you got to work hard. And I do all kind of work in order for me to be able to, to make it happen. Because my dad was paying for the tuition. I had to work to, for the living expenses, for everything, for the books, for the lab, for everything. Mm -hmm. But you know what? After four years, I was able to get out with a bachelor's degree, in electronics engineering technology. And, and then, you know, I find out in America, if you work hard, very hard, you can make it. And I, still today, I do not consider myself as being poor. Even when I was in the U.S., I see other kids, they were, of course, they were, they, they have, more chance than me, but we can make it happen. Mm. And that's why I don't like people complaining about, you know, I don't want to complain about me being poor. It all depends who you compare yourself to. Yeah. Yeah. As I'm looking at these kids in the US, you guys are very, you live in a very free country. You guys are lucky. You're part of the 1% in the world that hold all the wealth. The best that we can do really is to try to see, make the world a better place for everyone. Mm. And and that's what you guys are doing by by uh, by even talking and taking that class, mm -hmm. Social 119, and I think it's great. Okay, Ernso, let me. I'm going to go through a few more slides here um, for you all. Okay, first off, the, can you go to the next slide? So this this is um, the median household yearly income in Haiti and the United States. Now, mind you. In the, and for black Americans, the median household income is 46,000, but the average for the U.S. is 67. And median is, means that half of all the households earn more than that and half earn less than that. And so, you know, you really see here, compared to Haiti, and this is not just Haiti. We're using Haiti, of course, because this is a day to talk about Haiti because you're here, Ernso, but we could talk about anywhere. We could talk about Liberia. We could talk about, there's so many different countries. We could talk about Costa Rica. Um, but, you know, just the, the amount of, and again, it's not relative. It's expensive to live in Haiti. You know, a beer, a prestige beer in Haiti costs a dollar. When, you know, or costs a dollar fifty. It depends on where you buy it. So, like, you know, it's still, it's what a beer costs here, right? It's expensive. I, get, I calculate everything on the cost of a beer everywhere I go. It's all, it's all, it's the beer cost, you know. Um, but I want to, I want to show you a couple, I want to show a couple slides. Um, so, this is, these are a few photos that over the years that I've taken in Haiti. And I want to, and I would just kind of want to give you a, a sense you you may it may be easier if you just kind of turn around and and, and look but um, 
you know, this, this is somebody's house, right? And, you know, just really, really go into this space of that and, and what this means when we go into the next conversation. So next one, um, this is a street after it was raining. This is in Port-au-Prince. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just not everywhere looks like this, but in Port-au-Prince, in a lot of places, many places do. Okay, next slide. Um, this is just a, a, I took this from the, um, the, the from a, a particular vantage point. And then one more. And this is Ernso's house, right? And, you know, Ernso was really smart with his investments, you know, really working hard. It's a, re a nice place. By the way, if you ever want to, if you want to go to Haiti and visit Haiti and go visit Ernso, he has a guest house. So, uh, you know, talk to me. I'll give you the information. You can go visit him. And it's really awesome. Um, but what I, so what I would like to ask you about, um, go to the next slide. I want to talk about this young man here. So last time we were down there, my wife and I, we went down with a bunch of students, mostly from Social 119, and we met this young man. And he was just really remarkable, really um, was, learn was teaching himself English, uh, to the degree to which he couldn't speak English, he just made it work with speaking Creole. And, and he was, he's an entrepreneur, so just like you, Ernst, so he's, an, he's one of your people. And he is taught himself skills, got online, learned skills. He was making these bracelets and he learned how to make them online. And he would go out, he'd borrow money to go get the string. And then he would get someone to take him downtown where he could buy the string and he bought big rolls of it because he knew if he could buy big rolls of it, it was less expensive. And he'd come back and he'd make enough to pay them off. And they did this thing. One thing after another, he was just a young kid. It was phenomenal. So what I want to ask the three of you, it's like, how do you look at a young man like that, knowing that if he's, if he's born here, he's going, he's going the distance, man. How do you, how do you, in your mind, like, how do you do that? What do you, what do you, what do you think? How do you make sense of it? This young guy, any of you. It's a really open question, right? So just take it anywhere you want to go. Like, how do you make sense of that? Because, again, you know, it's hard work, hard work, but it doesn't matter. This kid's brilliant, but he's going to be there. He's not going to be here. And now, because visas have been shut off to the United States, he's not going to come here. Right? So how do, you, how do you make sense of that? And again, thinking from the perspective of your privilege. Like, because you're, you're sitting here, all these people are sitting here with just an incredible privilege. So how do you make sense? What would you say to this young kid? Go ahead, anybody. Um, I think he has the passion and drive of like, like fighting for like um, finance, finances and like maybe he's doing it for himself or his family. Um, but because he has no um, opportunity, it'll be hard and he can't, like, it's not really much to do. Like, even, like, selling brace bracelets, like, no offense, but, like, an average, well, I don't know because I'm not Haitian, but, like, I would imagine um, if I was there, I wouldn't want to buy, take my money to buy a bracelet because I have other, like, things to, like, I have other expenses to buy. Um, but, like, it's mostly for tour tourists. Yeah, for like, anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, it will be, like, the bracelets, mostly, like, maybe people who can afford it will buy it. But, like, a lot of people aren't buying this bracelet because they can't afford it. But, like, he has the passion. It's just he's not getting it out there because a lot of people can't afford it. Okay, so how, how does that feel for, imagine you're just sitting, you're, that's my wife sitting there, right? So imagine you're her. Where do you go in your thinking? Where do you go? Because you're here now, not for anything you did, but because, you know, your parents came to the U.S., right? And you're here now, and now you're sitting in the seat of just incredible privilege as a Penn State student, and you're getting ready to graduate, and, like, how do you, like, how do you manage that in your mind, in your heart, and, like, how do you manage it? 
By the way, I don't have a right answer. I'm just like, how do you manage that? I mean, it's really hard because it's like you would want to help them out anyway, but you really can't do much unless if like you're donating to like finding a way to donate to charities or something. But like a lot of it, the role of corruption also plays into it. So it's like you want to donate to these charities or whatever it is, but you don't know if that money is actually being used mm -hmm. to support them or like, you know, it's just, it's kind of hard. Like you have a heart, you have the empathy for them, but yeah. it's hard. So let me ask you, it's like that idea about corruption and then Adam or, or Dio, you go next. But that idea of corruption, maybe that's also one of those kind of shadows that we put out there so we don't have to, it's like, it's hard, it's difficult, it's no matter what you do, it's not enough, whatever. Like, there are all these things we can rationalize in our minds. Because somehow we have to, here, hang on one sec, let me just show you something. By the way, this is for everybody in class, right? Like, you... You're so privileged, so privileged. And, and the reason that two of the three students up here are black is because I wanna emphasize this. Because so often it's like, you know, we'll have people in the black community or the Native American community or the Latino community will be like, well, but not me because I'm here in the United States. No, 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 you are privileged. And so for me, and to be in this seat of privilege, now, Ern, so I'm sitting down next to everybody, I have to find some way to make sense of how it is that I'm here and he's not, and he will never be here. And the world's a big place, and just by chance and by luck, here I am, and I gotta make sense of this. So like, when I'm asking now the two of you, how do you make sense of that? Like, how do you deal with it day in and day out? I wrestle with this every single day. Like, how do you deal with it? I know Ernso does too, because I'm with Ernso when we're driving down the street in Haiti, right? Every time you stop at a stoplight, man, there's like five or six or 10 young kids around the car trying to do anything to get clean it sometimes the rag is so dirty they're they're cleaning your windshield and they're made and it was clean when they started but now it's dirty and you can't even see out of it because the rag is so filthy but yet they're trying anything to get you to roll the window down to give them something to eat right it's so like so how do you how do you yeah So I don't know if dealing with it is the right word because this is something I wrestle with too, um, especially because um, like there was so much random chance to my existence, but mm -hmm. also me being privileged mm -hmm. because um, basically just my parents met in Costa Rica one day, and I mean my family down there isn't isn't wealthy at all like they're average working class for that area and. I, I don't know, they just met and stuff happened and I'm here. And so it's, it's weird to think that, that I have that and my siblings have this and then all of my family down there does not because they're just in, on the same working class level. So I really don't even know how to make sense of it. Like it's just, it's just proof of how random and unfair the world is. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Well, first I would say this kid needs to be running some workshops here in America. I think uh, he's probably working harder than 80% of Americans here. But uh, I think the reason we can make sense of it, or rather we don't need to make sense of it, is because we, we live in a bubble. Um, unless we try to become global citizens, or even, even if we do become global citizens, we're still U.S. citizens, and that's the standard by which we live by. So we don't really look at what a lot of these other kids are doing or what a lot of these other countries are going through. And I think... Hang, hang on, hang on. No, I just want to go... I just want to do something with you. Speak, speak with I. Like, I'm, a, I'm an American citizen, and I... Just speak from yourself. <laughs> All right. Well, 
I mean, like I just said, uh, being an American citizen, I typically don't look at how privileged I am because me personally, I'm trying to rise to the top within America, which I'm not there yet. Um, so when I look at kids like him, I'm like, wow, that's, that's, that's insane. Let's give this kid a platform, but also at the same time, is that within my bandwidth currently? No. Is that within Sam's bandwidth? Maybe. But you can't do, even if we were to do it for him, we can't do it for anyone. And I think that's the hard part about making sense of it. Because even if you give 10 kids a platform from a uh, disenfranchised community or disenfranchised co uh, country, you can't do it for the millions of them. Okay, hang on. Ernso, can you respond to that? Um, well, like, like he said, sometimes there's, there's not too much that you can do, but as a, as a global, as a world citizen, you have to be worried about that. You have to know what can I do to bring a solution into that. But how do, how do you, Ernso, how do you, you know, when you make a decision to help one person and not another, and you know what it means when you help one person. You're not worried about yeah. helping all of Haiti. You're just worried. That, that's true, Sam. Well, Social 119 did that more than eight, nine years ago when I met you, yeah. when you met that girl yeah. that come from a very poor family. Which we're going we're gonna to talk about at, at the and end. And then here, we yeah. help her to achieve to her dream. Even though she was just like a little boy with no hope, something would happen. Social 119, make it happen. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then maybe you will talk about Melissa. Now she is a doctor. She can, she, she's helping the people in Haiti, helping her family, helping herself. She achieved her dream. I think that we have to go one person at a time. We cannot change the world entirely at once, but we have to go one at a time. Mm -hmm. And then and, and that's all I can say. And that, that little boy, uh, you know, we are helping him at Sakala, his organization, mm -hmm. helping him achieve his goal his dream is to become an entrepreneur. And, and then all we can do is help him to, to, to reach that, that destination in his life. So, so and, Ernso, let me just stop you there and ask you a different question. So one of the things in response to Adam, um, what he just said, is one thing that, you know, you and I both struggle with a lot because, you know, we, we've had a lot of, many opportunities to, we have many people coming to us and asking for assistance in some ways, right? How, how do you wrestle with your ability or willingness to say yes? And I'm going to say willingness because it's not just ability because you said Adam, you said, I don't really have the bandwidth. Dude, you have the bandwidth. I, I, we, earned some, we went to the hospital, the city hospital. Mm -hmm. you, you went with us, right? Yeah, you, yeah. yeah, we went. We went to the city hospital in Haiti. Somebody brought, a, they, they, were, they brought children into the hospital and, basic, and, and they had, there was no family. And there was this one child who was just alone in a crib who was probably three years old, but looked like the child was probably four months old. The child did not even have a name. And so the nurse asked Ernso and I and Lori, do you want to name the child? And the child's probably going to die, but at least she would have a name before she died. And neither of us, did, like we couldn't, even, we couldn't even do that. But we could, but you have the bandwidth. I had the bandwidth in that moment. Like, you know, you help this and that, but you have the bandwidth. I can, you can go to Haiti See Ernso. Ernso can take you to the hospital, and you could, you right there, could save a life. Like you, happen. It could happen in two days. You could save mm -hmm. a couple lives. So it's like, yeah, we have the bandwidth. So how do you decide to do that or not do that? So Ernso, for you, like, how do you wrestle with that? Like you know, because oftentimes it can be an excuse to say, like, not an excuse, but we all need a way, right, Ernso, like when you're driving down the street and the kids are knocking on the car window 
and you always have change. You just always, always, always have change in the car. Definitely. But you don't always roll your window down. There's sometimes when you just don't. Maybe because you ran out of change or like, oh my God, you just can't, you can't anymore. There's so many kids. It's like, how do you, how do you sit with that? And by the way, everybody in class right now, what I just said to Adam, I say to you. I could point you in the direction where you actually literally would save a human life. And do you do it? Do you not do it? I mean, if you say, no, I don't do it. How? Why? Like, why? Like, what's, it's, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm, I just want to know how do you, what kind of mental gymnastics do we do to not do that? So, earn so. How about you, like, when you just can't, I don't know. I don't even know what I want to ask you. How do you, how do you, first off, how do you live with it every day? Mm, it is hard. Uh -huh. But, but, you know, you have to do, you have to do what you can. You cannot, you cannot save the world, but you can save a family. You can save one person and tomorrow, one at a time. Yeah. But you cannot live in this world without, without doing anything at all. So that you don't care about what's going on around you. You have to care. And that's, that's what you guys are in this class, I guess. <laughs> yeah. To be able to, be able to, to, to help and share what you have with the world. You know, Ernst, I, can I... I remember, if ahead. you remember, Sam, I think it's three or four years ago when you, when you were down with about 15 to 16 students yeah. who would teach in Haiti at, at, for the kids to use, at your social media. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, these are stuff that you, you already know, and, but they don't know. You go there and, and then you share with them what you have. Some of them never forget that. There, there are two of them that become entrepreneurs because of that, that thing. Yeah. That just a small visit that you make yeah. for, 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 for a few days. You can make a difference in somebody's life. And do not underestimate what you can do. Yeah. Know and, what you can do. There's so much that you can do. And, 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 yeah. and, and you can laugh about it the whole time, right? And so one of, let me just say this. One of the th things that I really appreciate um, about my friend here is my relationship with him is even in the most dire of circumstances how much he and I are able to laugh. And because you have to laugh. Because if you don't laugh, you just get paralyzed. And just guttural laughter, you know, in these kinds of situations. Except at the hospital, man. That was the one time when both of us were... <laughs> No. We were stunned, yeah. man. We were stunned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, so I want to go to another. I want to go to another conversation here. I want to get very specific now. Can you go? Can you go to the next slide? So, um, there's currently there are more slaves in the world today than at any point in human history. Okay, between 35 and 40 million people are enslaved in the world. That was not the case in the. Um, I mean, more at any point in history. And in the, in the, in the, the life of a slave today is worth much less than li life of a slave during chattel slavery in the Americas, okay? So back when we had legalized slavery in the Americas. Um, the life of a slave today is worth much, much less. And, and these are young kids in the Congo on the DRC who are mining cobalt and coltan. And so do you have your phone? So like... Every one of your phones has the, the minerals, the precious uh, metals that these, these young people are, are mining. Every one of us. Every computer, this laptop, this phone, everybody. And um, they, about 25% of all the slaves in the world are children. So the, two, the three of you, right? Like how, like you have, look, like, like, there's, like, there's slavery in this, 
right? There's slavery in this. Like, how do you, I don't know, how, how do you sit with, here, hold your phone in your hand, okay? I mean, this is, this is a slavery unlike, unlike you would imagine. Okay, so how do you, yeah, how do you, where do you go with that? Um, I mean, I knew about the situation that was going on um, in Congo with, like, the cobalt. But, like, it's an iPhone. Like, it's, it's pretty popular. But, like, when I buy a new phone, I'm, like, I'm not, like, oh, my gosh, like, children were being slaves for this. Like, it's just, like, something to turn a blind eye to because it's, like, popular in an iPhone. I can't, like, imagine myself walking around with a flip phone, honestly. Okay, so. but let me, let me, so let me ask you, right? So you're from, okay. your family, your ancestry is from Liberia. Mm-hmm. So if we go back 300 years, the Portuguese were in Liberia um, taking Africans from Liberia, putting them on ships and sending them to, to the, the Americas, okay? Now, by chance, there were certain people who your lineage going back, they were not captured and they were not sent on a ship over to the Americas, right? Mm -hmm. But think about how you now just answered the question. It's like, well, but it's an iPhone and like, so now go back 300 years to the people buying, buying the products that were being made by not your ancestors, but well, some of your ancestors, right? were enslaved, like some of your direct ones, somebody was, but like, what would you say to them? You know what I mean? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you manage that? Because like, if I said, if I said, for example, yeah, okay, my ancestors, yeah, they, they had, they supported slavery and they got rich over slavery, but you know, other people were doing it. I don't know, like, what were they not going to do it? They had to live, and, like, you know, they, slaves were picking cotton, and the, the, but the cotton was really nice, and, like, people wanted it, and, like, okay, like, so I don't know. What am I supposed to do? Like, it's fine. Like, so I'm, I'm, I'm just pushing you on this. Like, okay, what? Um, I think it's kind of hard because, like, I'm not directly feeling the effects of it. Mm-hmm. So it's like I'm able to turn a blind eye to it. Like, Mm -hmm. I heard about the situation, but I was like, oh my gosh, like, that's horrible. But I I wasn't like, oh no, I'm gonna get rid of my phone. Like, Mm -hmm. it's it's kind of easy to turn a blind eye to something when it's like, not directly affecting you. Uh So I think that's what makes it different. So do you ever hear black Americans here, how often do you hear black Americans here in the United States talking about like slavery? Oh, yeah, you know, the, um, the, the legacy of slavery, the legacy of discrimination, the legacy. I hear it a lot. Um, and, like, I would talk about it, but, like, with my country, my country was never enslaved. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it... Well, your country wasn't, but, like, your country wasn't a country, right? Yeah. So when I said that about ancestry, I don't mean... Your country didn't exist, so... Yeah. So it's yeah. like, I, like, I feel with them, and I'm like, oh, yeah, like oppressed people and everything and like I would still talk about it because like though like my people weren't directly like I didn't descend from slaves um my people were directly from Liberia so okay it's hard to but listen okay but listen it it it, but but in the end it really so I'm asking you this question then so you're with other black students let's just say students right and they're talking about the legacy of slavery or something Mm -hmm. what if you were to just pick your pick up your cell phone and be like dudes what the fuck like right here did in your phone like why are you talking about slavery 300 years ago talk about it right now like here it is it's right here here we can i can i can open up look i can open up youtube and in like 15 seconds, I can pop up a video about slavery in cell phones. So we could do that. Like, what, what, why do you want to just talk about that? Let's talk about this. Like, so why, what would keep you from doing that? And then I want to ask Adam. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's because, like, it's no direct effect on, mm-hmm. like, um, black Americans. It's no, like, but, like, actually like the transatlantic slave trade like that's yeah. it's like kind of like your descent like your descendants of the slaves that was bought here 
but like versus things that's like, and I, I can admit this now, a lot of black Americans are ignorant to things that's going on in Africa. Like yeah. they don't care about them because they, like it's a conversation of like black, like black Americans versus Africans. Yeah. Like it's, it's, a, it's a real thing. So it's like a lot of them turn a blind eye to like what's going on in Africa. Like mm-hmm. they don't, it's not directly affecting them so they don't care about it. Okay, all right, I got you. So Adam, how about you? And I wanna take this slavery conversation to another step. And I wanna say the following. Everybody in this room, every single person in this room has clothing in our closets that's been made that is directly connected to slavery and sweatshops, okay? So I wanna show you just two more photos here. Um, um, Nidhi, go with one more. And so this is, this is a young, these are young girls in Bangladesh. This is them 12 to 14 hours a day. And then one more. Um, these are young, t- the last, you know, we talked, Mira was, is from Addis Ababa, remember, from last class, one of our camera ops. And these are young girls in Addis Ababa making clothes. And, you know, so. Okay, so do, how, how is that? Like, you know, your wardrobe, bro, like. Now, I have to be honest, this is going to be a multifaceted answer, but if I were to talk with my friends and family back in Philly, I'm probably going to get a joke, something like, yeah, but it's going to start with maybe something like, yeah, but we're still trying to get our reparations, y'all you know I mean, something like that. Or, you know, that John's crazy and everything, but what about the life we're trying to live? You know, everyone always brings it back to how we are. And personally, I, as I've been sitting here and thinking about it, it's one of those things where it really depends on the type of person you are. And, and for me, at least, I think although there are a lot of people in a, in a less fortunate situation than I am, what I owe to them is that I'm going to use my platform and my opportunity to drive as much change as I can in the lifestyle that I have and into my community. Uh, because personally, it's like, although Philadelphia, most, most black people, most uh, minorities in Philadelphia are not nearly on the same spectrum as people in Haiti and other countries, what I feel like I can do in my life is at least empower them within this community. And that's the kind of mindset that I, I feel like is gonna drive that growth. So when it comes down to it, having those conversations, you can only go but so far in terms of like the people you're, you're talking to. You know, uh, much mm-hmm. of my family and, and, and friends, they're not, they're gonna be like, yeah, man, that's cool and all, but uh, <laughs> how does that pertain to me? Like, how am I gonna so, do that? It's, it's really hard once, once you have a sort of uh, level set that's already in place. So therefore, when people, especially white people say, I'm just not really interested in race. Like, I don't really, I don't wanna talk about it. It doesn't, it doesn't affect me. So I don't really wanna, why should I have to deal with it? Why should I have to take a class on diversity? Why should I have to learn about these issues when it doesn't affect me? Like, I don't care, I don't, I don't care. I'm, I'm, you know, I got my own shit to worry about. So you understand that. I mean, it's the same thing, like, in, in Philly, we're one of, like, 14 cities in the country that we mandate African-American history. And there's even black people who are like, man, why am I learning African-American history? I'm black. Yeah. What do I need that for? Yeah, yeah. I already know enough. Mm-hmm. That's what a lot of, that's what, I hear that sometimes from black people at, <laughs> about Social 119. <laughs> like, oh, I took Social 119. I didn't learn anything. I'm like, Really? You, you didn't learn anything, so why don't I'll hire you then to teach the class for me next semester because clearly you know it all. Got it? Dio, and then Ernso, I want to come back to you. I want to see what you think about these responses. How do you, how do you deal with it? That you, you, have, you have clothing made by slaves. So <laughs> you have all sorts of products made yeah, by slaves. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we live in a world where, like, like you were just no, saying. No, hang on, hang on. I live in a world. Sorry. Talk, I live just in talk a... about you. How do you okay. manage this? Okay. Well, I was, I was getting there. All right, but, all right. Um, <laughs> just like you were saying, it's uh, really... No, the reason, I, I'm going to cut you off one more time. The reason I did that is because too often we go to, we philosophize as a way to not have to wrestle with the things that we really need, would be good for us to wrestle with. So I'm saying, no, just wrestle, man. Go inward and wrestle. Go ahead. Okay, in that case, my answer is I really don't even 
n even begin to know how to deal with this. Okay. <laughs> like, it's, because it's something I don't think about, and, you know, it's something that, like, people around me don't really think about, you know what I mean? It's, like, most, like, uh, yeah, most of us, I, don't have reason to think about these things we're given. Um, you know, like, oh, here's a phone. You don't think about where the phone comes from. You just have a phone. Uh, and, and, and then and you don't want to, because if yeah. you want to, mm. if you well, find out, it's going to be a problem. Yeah, it's upsetting. And so this class has gotten me to think a bit more about it. But at the same time, you also get into a question of, like, how do you even avoid these things? Because it's so commonplace, which is awful. Like, I'm not saying that's the right way to think about things. Yeah. But, okay, but, that's fair. Dude, I, I love that. I love, I love all three of your answers, right? That my job, I don't have an answer. My job is to wrestle. If you're not, if you're not wrestling with it, I, I mean, I just happen to wrestle with it every day. It's just part of what I do. When I'm with Ernso, that's all we do is wrestle with it, right? Hey, Ernso, um, can we, I want to I introduce them so are we are we good here? We're in the re we've we've wrestled now. We're good. Now you can think about it. It's like Thon. You know, it's like you it's a similar thing as Thon, right? You just you know, you you don't you can't save you can't help every child in every family that has cancer, but you're going to help some. And so that's why we have Thon. And Thon's an awesome thing because because you get to help some. And this is what it is. So we get a feel for that. And so Kudos to everybody who is involved in THON. Can you go to one more slide? Um, one more. So this is Melissa. And Melissa is a young woman who showed up at Ernso's church when she was, Ernso, how old was she? Like 12 or something? Oh, Melissa was about 12. Yeah. When, and, she, when she came to our church. And she wanted to learn English. She, she came to his <laughs> church because she just wanted... And she had a really vibrant person. I heard her twin, her twin sister. And so mm -hmm. Melissa Ernso said, he was in Social 19, and he said, Why don't, can, we just, can we just sponsor her to go to finish her grade school out and then finish high school out and then let's put her through college. And we said, yeah, let's do it. So we had projects for years and years and years and she became a doctor. She, she, that's her operating on somebody and that's her on the left and like awesome and that's like what students in 119 did but now Ernso you have another idea yeah uh, <clears throat> first of all Social 119 has been sponsoring Melissa to become a doctor for so many years now she's finished she's doing her social work right now at the general hospital in Puerto Prince Haiti and uh now we want to take this, this thing a little further. Uh, because sustainability, that's what I always tell people. Now we want to, to build a clinic uh, where Melissa can work as a doctor and supporting the community uh, like on, like on a day-to-day -day basis. Now we are working with Melissa so she can practice her medicine and then we can support the people uh, like in the community by having like a, a clinic, a lab, and a pharmacy, and be able to do to run some regular tests. If there is some major thing that we cannot do, we can uh, uh, direct them to other, other private hospital because healthcare in Haiti is the most expensive uh, thing there are. And, and then any way we can or achieve that goal. That's what we want to do. Because we, the project is to help Melissa become a doctor. Now she's a doctor. Let's take it a little further now, is by helping uh, her, uh, not only uh, for herself, but for the family, but also for the community to, to, to go further in her career. And in the That's community. what we are, we are doing right now. We want to start in June. We like to start a clinic in in Puerto Prince area where people can come as a very low cost. They can have they can have medical care uh, for the people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ernso, the reason I and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to go back to what you think about 
the answers that the three students had. I just want to make sure that we had enough time. So the, the goal, what we're looking for is somebody, family, somebody, anybody who wants to really participate in helping to build this somehow, contributing to it in a, in a serious way, not just a couple dollars here and there, but really in a serious way. And a couple dollars is fine, but you understand, right? So the, the message to, to you all is like, hey, maybe you want to kind of participate in this. Maybe this is something that you're, um, you want to go into medicine and you want to do this, or maybe your family. But it's, very, it's, it's a lot of fun working with Ernso, and it's a lot of fun meeting people because there's nothing like working with Haitians. And maybe you want to participate. So we're just th we're throwing we're throwing casting putting casting the net in the water, right, my friend? Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Listen. Final thing. Um, tell me what you think of the answers about the these answers about slavery and. Okay. I don't know if they, well, I, I tell them to follow international news this past two weeks because now these days we have like what you call the modern slavery. Uh, think about, we have about 30,000 people making jeans in Haiti. They, they ask them to make 72 pair of jeans every day. They, they only pay, they only person. paying them yeah. $5 a day. Wait, wait, hang on, Ernso, hang on. Listen, yo. No, 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 you're good. Ernso, we have yes, we I'm, have two I'm here. you have two minutes. Go ahead. Okay, uh, like I'm saying that this is modern slavery. Like this past week, nine people died because they were rioting. They say that we want to get paid at least ten dollars a day because. While these jeans are being sold in the U.S. for big money, you cannot pay these people ten dollars a day to make these jeans. This is not fair, and they cannot survive on what they are making. Some of them have families, and it's, it's, it's slavery. Mm -hmm. I call it slavery. Now, this is what the fight is all about. We gonna, we have to do something. We cannot accept some stuff that happening. Uh, I don't say that capitalism is not good. It is, it, is, it is a way of life, but we have to kind of help people to, to get a better life because we cannot continue on that train of slavery. You find it in different countries, Cambodia, Africa, and, and Haiti, closest to us, is, is, mm -hmm. is, we find that every day. Mm -hmm. It's there. And, and I like some of your answers, but I know what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Yeah, that's that's always your yo. Know, that's always your question to everybody. What are we gonna do? Hey, Ernso, thank you, and thanks to the three of you. Thank you very much. 